and Ross will be keeping on five. Brian will start off the game just on basic island. Already, at this point, you can assume these players know what the other person's on. Brian will be playing around Wasteland as much as possible. Yep. And another saving grace here for Ross potentially is Miracles, they draw a lot of clunkers. Their hands that don't involve the bonding top can be really slow, can have some cards that are not easy to cast, can be bottlenecked with some Miracle effects. So uh, even though Brian kept seven, there's no guarantee he has a particularly good hand. Yeah, Ross with the turn one ponder. He'll get to fix his mulligan up there to get some pressure on the next turn. Brian's hand, a, a lot of question marks, it looks like. I believe he has a lot of lands. He, he does have two brainstorms with that fetch land, so he'll be able to turn his hand into what he needs it to be. So you see he starts for trying for one brainstorm while Ross is tapped down. Draws counterbalance, Arid Mesa, and Jace the Mind Sculptor. Not a bad way to clean up that hand. No, that does take some of his... does kind of give him a little bit of everything. Now, I'm interested to see if Brian is even going to try to make counterbalance a thing this game. He's playing against a five-card hand, which makes it more attractive to try to step the lock. But he also might just say, I don't even want to bother with Abrupt Decay. I don't want to worry about that card. Get rid of the counterbalance and just try to beat Ross with counter spells, removal, and something like Chase the Mind Sculptor down the line. Yeah, it looks like he has gone with the counterbalance option, maybe preying on that multi It's been He kept it in his hand after the brainstorm. So he will be trying to assemble the lock. Though no divining top yet, and that's really the, the crucial piece to it. Yeah. Back over to Ross. He got to ponder on turn one. Now he'll get to have a throw in the second turn. That's going to be Deathrite Shaman. Leaves up a mana. As we are on to turn three. And this is back onto Brian's side. See, there's a Jace he wants to set up for. Leave a Swords to Plowshares. Now, I want to see how Brian goes about trying to compound Ross's mulligan. When your opponent mulligans to five, you try to want to turn the game into a one-for-one -one trade fest. Uh, the other side of that is it becomes slightly more attractive to just go for the counterbalance lock here because Ross is less likely to have an abrupt decay as a result. See, so Brian. you can try to go for the free win, or you can try to go for the long haul. Yeah, he has fetched here for Tundra. So it does have single white or double blue open, and it's going to be double blue. He'll go ahead and make counterbalance, leaving up one mana. And this does put pressure on Ross to have that abrupt decay. Trap the turn, does Ross have it? He does have Death Rite Shaman in play. I believe I see an abrupt decay in Ross's hand. Yeah, Sultai Delver, one of the decks that can interact favorably with a counterbalance lock. And Ross has the abrupt decay in hand, but doesn't have any more lands. So he'll just be passing the turn. And I think if Brian does something Significant, Ross will get rid of the counterbalance and respond accordingly. And if not, Ross may just say, all right, well, I'll shoot you with the death rate, Shaman. No rush to get the counterbalance off the table. Brian plays a land. And Ross is going to go ahead and end step abrupt decay the counterbalance. He'll take the land out of Brian's graveyard to do that. That is actually the only land in, gra in graveyards as of right now. And Ross going to try to brainstorm here. Still has that uncracked fetch land. Brian has drawn a copy of Counterspell. Could use it here, though. That would be very aggressive. Yeah, I'm not... I mean, when you have no information on what the nature of Ross's hand is, I guess it, Brian's probably going to try to set up Jace next turn and just wants to use the Counterspell on something while he's got the two mana laying about. It's a very aggressive use. Well, here's a fetch for... By you from Ross, and now that's my counter. He'll go ahead and make Tarmogoyf. Still no third land, but has two threats. This should force some action from Brian. Yeah, Brian still doesn't have to make a move on the Jace just yet. He can take his time here. He can use Council's Judgment. He can brainstorm to improve his hand. Well, if he wants to Jace, he could Jace and unsummon the Tarmogoyf. But then, you know, he's in a spot next turn where he has to draw cards and fire back to find something to answer the board. I think that Brian has enough resources to work with here that he can just take his time slowly but surely answer Ross's threats and, and pick a better spot to play the Jace. I don't think he wants to get in a spot where he's playing Jace to unsummon things if he can avoid it. Play Jace, unsummon a creature, and leave you with a creature in play is generally not a winning play. Yeah, and looks like that's what he'll do. He'll go ahead and brainstorm here. Has two uncracked fetch lands. But you can see how the Sultai Delver deck is able to run resource light. Ross Mulligan to five, but he's doing just fine. 
Yeah, he only has two lands in play, but it doesn't really feel like he needs more right now. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing in this deck that costs more than this except for Bouliana the Veil. Deathrite Shaman helping to be that third mana if he needs it on a crucial turn. Yeah, a couple cards back for Brian, maybe Council's Judgment. Now he'll crack both his fetch lands, so he'll go down to 17. I believe has kept a copy of Force of Will in his hand. So still a good spot for Brian. Yeah, just trying to kind of parry these attacks. Yep. Once the board's clean and he feels like he can play around the soft permission in Ross's hand, then you can try to land Jace. That's outside of a Prompt Decay range. Very hard to kill. Yeah, and here's one of those copies of Council's Judgment from Brian. So that'll take care of any one of Ross's permanent, non, any of his creatures. Looks like it'll be Tarmogoyf. Actually, no, it's going to be Deathrite Shaman. Yeah, just trying to pin Ross a little bit on mana. Also, keep in mind, Brian Stack plays with two copies of Snapcaster Mage. So uh, that frees up all sorts of value in Brian's graveyard if he has Snapcaster Mage. Time away at a 4-5. By taking care of Deathrite, he does pin Ross on mana, but that does cost him a, a fair amount of damage. Time going to swing in for 4 and put Brian down to 13. Ross, four cards in hand, still with a lot of resources available. And Brian might be just playing for Jace next turn, and Jace with the Unsummon is very potent when the board's just Tarmogoyf. Yeah. Well, now it's not just Tarmogoyf, it's gonna be two Tarmogoyfs, and Brian is setting up for that Jace turn. It's gonna be Force of Will pitching Brainstorm, and Ross still wants to have that second threat. It's Deathrite Shaman for him. That's not bad for Ross. I mean, as long as he can keep another creature in play, all right, well, never mind. Brian, <laughs> Brian Miracle's term is for the turn. That's huge. But can, yeah, I, I was going to say, I actually, what I really like about Ross was his land sequencing there. So he played the Tarmogoyf and made it look as though he tapped out for it. And in, in Brian's thought, he thinks if he can force a will the Tarmogoyf and then play Jace to unsummon the other Tarmogoyf, then he's got a winning board. Yep. But Ross, by doing that, getting the force of will and then saying, oh, by the way, land three, death right, go. I think he got Brian to play in a way which he may not have otherwise done. Yeah, it was great sequencing. And Ross put himself in the position there where Brian, it would have been a little sketchy for him to tap out for the Jason and unsummon. But now uh, it's pretty smooth sailing from Brian's side of the table as Ross can only follow up with Tassiker. And he doesn't have a stopped graveyard here to recast the Tassiker through an unsummon next turn. Yeah, so he casts Tassiker. Brian and Step's going to play Snapcaster on Brainstorm. So he'll get to Brainstorm here, have a blocker, and yeah, Jace unsummoning Tastiger will be is a really strong setup. Yeah. And Brian's done a great job on his own side of just making this game about Jace. Yes. And just trade, trade, trade. I've got seven cards against your five. My cards are also more powerful than yours, so I'll eventually win the game as long as I use my mana efficiently and get to my late game stuff. Yeah, well, he's been setting up this kind of nest spot where, you know, he's like, okay, I want to get this Jace in a really nice, comfortable spot. Yeah, he did not rush it because he had enough brainstorms and counter spells and removal spells to uh, not have to rush it. And from Ross's side, you really can't cast Tassiger into an onboard Jace, so he's going to go brainstorming. It is one of the vulnerabilities of Tassiger. It is a little bit worse against Jace than most threats are. Most creatures are not very good against Jace. Uh, Tassiger is especially not good. There are few clean answers to Jace the Mind Sculptor in Ross's deck once it's on the board. Yeah, there's no creeping tar pit, which is sometimes you, something you see right. in these decks to help out a little bit. It's just here to stay at this point, unless Ross can muster together a lot of attackers, and that's going to be very hard to do. Beating an onboard Jace, all sorts of difficult. He'll, after Brainstorm, play Burden Catacomb and pass the turn. And now the question is, how far can Brian pull away with this Jace? You see his hand is a Snapcaster and a Ponder. And the Jace game is going to start. It'll brainstorm, and <laughs> it'll start in fashion. He gets land, counterbalance, and Sensei's Divining Top off the first set of Jace draws. Yeah, and it looks like Brian is going to try to reestablish the lock here. It looks like he's keeping counterbalance and Divining Top. So that makes sense. Plays the fetch land, swings Snapcaster Mage. And we'll see if Ross has a play here. And at this point, Ross is just sort of 
just playing out the game to, to play it out. I don't think he can really win from the spot. Ryan's just done too much in the Jaces, uh, locking out most of Frost's very good draws, but no reason not to play on. As we go back here, over to Ross. We still know about that Tasker in his hand. All right, Jace is just continuing to draw extra cards. Ross, here's four man of his own. He'll go for Tassiger again. Delves down to just one card in his graveyard. And it's back over to Brian's side. Draws another copy of Ponder. Or rather, redraws his old copy of Ponder. Snapcaster swings in. Jace unsummons the Tassiger again. And counterbalance and Sensei's Divining Top are the plays for Brian. And no guarantee this even really matters that much. Ross can still break out of this with an abrupt decay, but uh, that's the only the starting point for Ross to get back in this game. Well, right. I mean, it, sure, it is a lock, but at the same time, Ross hadn't really broken out of the lock of just Jace. Right. And Ross just going to make Brian do it. He wants to see the win cons. He'll spin top. At this point, Brian is just going to be looking for his one and treat the angels. Or, or just or Snapcaster. Just Snapcaster Mage. Or... He can also transition to Fate Sealing Ross. He has no way to shuffle his deck in play, so. Go to the top rope. Lots of options. Brian's going to crack the fetch land, it looks like. Ross tries to abrupt decay. The Sensei's Divining Top. So in response, Brian will draw a card with the Divining Top. Ross using that play to make Brian shuffle away his own top. Yep. Or lose it. Either way, Brian doesn't get to keep it. Could mean a couple things. Maybe Ross has another uh, abrupt decay here. Also could mean that he just feels like the counterbalance doesn't matter very much if Ross's plan is to try to get this task card into play. And back over to Brian's turn. Draw there now. The, the punchline is that Brian had a second Divining Top in his hand and a third one yep. this whole time. So getting rid of it, not going to be too helpful there. Jace goes ahead and brainstorms. We see uh, the last Divining Top in two more lands. It wasn't for lack of effort. Ross tried his best to get the Divining Top off the table for good, but Brian with the backup. Yeah, just putting together more Snapcaster attacks. This one will go in. Ross down to 10. Ross, with that abrupt decay, also might be wanting to cast it so that he can go for Tassiger another time. Yeah, I, I think it's a couple different reasons here. Yeah, and you see the follow-up here. Now he's got Tassiger on the cheap, can get back into play. Yep, abrupt decay on counterbalance, knocks, knocks the lock pieces out of play again. Ross still hasn't seen anything like swords to plowshares out of Brian. So here's Tassiger, takes care of two abrupt decays. third time. This time, if Brian wants to unsummon it, it will cost him. And I, I don't think Brian's going to pursue that avenue. He can always yeah. just go back to brainstorming with the Jason, trying to overpower the Tassica or finding a removal spell. It's going to be Snapcaster on end step here. That's going to go for a counter spell, actually, for Tassica. So that'll be countered. And at that point, Ross doesn't even have an outside line. I think he was just waiting for Brian to show him an answer to Tassica. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Brian did a very good job there, making Ross spin his tires there for a couple turns. And Ross not going to try to play anymore once the situation became that hopeless. All right. So Brian Brown doing up a game, one game away from another 8 and 0 day one. Quite a few of them in the Invitationals last year felt like a lot of X1s, a lot of XOs. Uh, wasn't able to parlay any of them into a top eight finish, but only a matter of time. You 8 0 enough day ones. Eventually, you're going <laughs> to top eight. That's, exactly what that's I was how thinking. That's how that works. All right. We did mention, though, previous Invitational successes. Brian has a lot of them under his belt. The most recent Invitational, though, if you remember, that was quarter four. That was last December. This was Dylan Donegan as he took down the finals with his Jess guy, with his Del with Blue Red Delver, I believe. Yeah, and with uh, Jess Guy tokens and standard deck that he's playing this weekend as well. We have him in a feature match in round one. And for a limited time only, because remember, we're going to have more Invitational winners and more tokens coming down the pipeline. If you want to get the Dylan Donegan Elemental token, you can register for a 20K Open Series event any Premier 5K or 
any order from StarCityGames.com in excess of $5. So if you want to get your token, you should place your order or join one of our large events as soon as possible. Yeah, these are free to all players in the Open Series and any of the Premier IQs. Now, not, these are not just our Premier IQs, but any Premier IQ held in a country or around the world. So if you find one of your local ones on StarCityGames.com, you'll receive this there. And remember, if you want to know how you could ever get yourself on our token, these all the Invitational winners get immortalized on their own tokens. So we'll have another one in the works by the end of this weekend. Yep. We have the Derek Sheet Swan, the Tom Ross Infect token, the Tom Ross Vampire, and the Dylan Donegan Elemental token as the 2014 tokens from the Invitationals. All right, well, looking at the sideboard, Ross Miriam, that game, had a pretty coherent game plan, but the fact that he was, I think that he was on five cards did, did matter. He was threat light and never really able to stick anything. Um, what can he do out of the sideboard to help this? Well, he's got a Grattaker's Cage, a Pithy Needle, two Nile Spell Bombs, three Thought Seizes, a Dismember, a Fluster Storm, a Vendillion Click, a True Name Nemesis, a Jason the Mind Sculptor, a Sylvan Library, and two Golgari Charms. A lot of good action going on here. I like Sylvan Library, Jason the Mind Sculptor. I think True Name Nemesis is pretty solid against Miracle. Sometimes it's just a three power creature for three, but Miracle has tried to remove spells and block with Entreat and so forth, so I like True Name in the matchup. Vendillion Click, Fluster Storm, and the three copies of Thought Seize alongside the Pithy Needle. Some huge upgrades here on Ross's side. Yeah, Sylvan Library and Jace the Mind Sculptor also are pretty decent tonight. He's oh, got a yeah. match that goes late. Yeah, no, it is. Uh, he's got a lot of action here to disrupt Brian early and stay with him in terms of power level as we move to the mid and late game. And now on Brian's side, he does have some extra options, but I, it does seem more difficult after sideboard, but where can he go? He has an Entreat the Angels, a Pithy Needle, two copies of Wear Tear, an additional Dig Through Time, a uh, Pyroclasm, three copies of Pyroblast, two Containment Priests, two Metal Mage, two Spell Pierce. The Power Blast, the additional Dig Through Time, the additional Entreat the Angels, they're all pretty good. Nothing major here, uh, but some, some upgrades around the perimeter of the deck. Yeah, he just wants to make sure, I would think, that his spells are able to trade one for one. And in the main deck, it seems like he doesn't have too many problems with that. He was able to do that game one, and I can't imagine his configuration will change much. Yeah, uh, this game plan might be as simple as Brian cutting his copies of Counterbalance for four cards that can't be killed by Abrupt Decay. And at that point, do you get into a guess... How, how does the guessing game play out? Does Ross have to start cutting his Abrupt Decays? Well, Ross has a really potent hedge here in terms of keeping in the Abrupt Decays because he knows that Brian is playing with Snapcaster Mage. Historically, Brian has played with Stoneforge Mystic in the sideboard of his deck. Uh, and the worst case scenario, it takes down an Entreat token, which comes up a fair bit in the matchup. So if Brian has left in his, uh, his copies of Counterbalance, you definitely want your Abrupt Decays. And even in the event that he's cut all of them, he's probably going to present targets over the course of the game. So I think Ross just leaves them in to be safe. Maybe he cuts one and goes down to three, but I don't think he's going to do anything dramatic and cut all of his copies. Yeah, last game, he was even able to snag a Sensei's Divine Tap with an Abrupt Decay. Now, that's obviously not ideal for it, but Brian still did present that. Yeah. So it's not the ideal card in the matchup if Brian has cut his counterbalances, but they're still very potent if he's left them in. And even if he has cut them, it's hard for Abrupt Decay to be completely dead in the matchup. Well, this time it's going to be Ross keeping and Brian on the mulligan. Ross on the play here, so we'll see just where that ends up. I've but seen yeah. some Miracle Sex goes some pretty extreme sideboarding where they're just a Jace the Mind Sculptor lock deck against Abrupt Decay decks, but Brian doesn't have the ability to convert in such a fashion. Well, sometimes you see the Miracles decks play an enchantment-based sideboard, things like Blood Moon, Rest in Peace against a Sultai deck. But Brian doesn't have any of that today. Yeah, Reed Duke, who's playing behind Brian Brondowin right now, uh, is doing that sort of enchantment sideboard. He does have Blood Moons, he does have Rest in Peace, so that's his plan against Sultai. Uh, Brian's plan is just kill your stuff, play with powerful cards, and eventually win the game with Jace or something similar. Or Entreat, or, yeah. Yeah, just whatever. There really isn't a lot of focus on the win condition. Sometimes the Miracles approach in these kind of matchups is as simple as my cards are better than yours. So as long as I don't get wastelanded out or tempoed out of the game, eventually I'll win with something. doesn't really matter what it is. All right. Looks like Brian keeping on a six. And with that, we are underway. This is game two here. Ross is going to start with a fetch land on his side. He does have both Delver and Seek of Secrets and Deathrite Shaman is available one drops. And as last game, is going to be Deathrite Shaman to start it out. So we go over to Brian. And not wanting to give Ross any mana, he's going to go ahead and turn one Swords to Plowshares away the Deathrite. Not messing around here. Not want, doesn't want to give Ross any mana. Doesn't want to get hit by a Spell Pierce or a Fluster Storm. Just get it off the table. 
Yeah, that said, Ross is going to well, he's willing to fight over this one. He has days. I'll take care of swords to plowshares. He'll get to keep his creature for now, at least. Days is an interesting card against Miracles because it's so powerful on turns one and two and then just goes just completely down the <laughs> toilet after that. So often the right strategy with Days, in my opinion, in this matchup is just the first good thing you can days, just do it. Yeah. Ross is going to start out by brainstorming off of the fetch land in Brian's graveyard. Maybe hit a fetch land of his own and just get that, that full brainstorm. Well, and we said that before, when we said Del Delver earlier, a lot of times when the Delver's on the aggressive plan, its strategy is to get ahead and then trade, which really, that's what Ross is doing with this with days. So once he's at, he, if he's just able to trade the days with anything, he'll go ahead and take it. Exactly. I mean, if it's a turn one, let's say it's a turn one ponder, something that isn't powerful and doesn't impact the board, maybe Ross lets it go. But I think in that spot, he's, he's got a strong incentive just to do it on the first thing that Brian presents. Source of Plowshare is definitely good enough. So it goes ahead and brainstorms, then now cracks a fetch land. Puts, able to really sculpt his hand here. And this will be Tropical Island for Delver of Secrets. Really great opening for Ross so far has got an opportunity to improve his hand. <laughs> but Brian Ooh. with the answer. This is the natural terminus. And Brian just on his side. This is the second time he's pulled this one on Ross. You can see a chuckle here. Last game, it wasn't clear if Ross could have won even if it didn't happen. This game, it's a, a huge deal. Yeah, this will get a two for one. It won't clear off Ross's board as he does have force of will still in. So he takes care of terminus there. But... Can't that be mad. had the potential to be backbreaking. Cannot be mad about that if you're Brian. I mean, getting a force of will out in that spot now, uh, Ross is running very low on cards. And this is the type of situation where even something as innocuous as Source of Plowshares plus Snapcaster Mage might run Ross out of gas. Yeah, Brian does have the Source to Plowshares in his hands. You see him fetch for another copy of Tundra. Yeah, you, giving up that two for one for Miracles is really difficult when you're the Sultai player. You want, to, you want to be saving it for Jace the Mind Sculptor or some big play. Having to use it on a Terminus this early on in the game, I mean, good, it's good for Ross that he had the Force of Will to be able to play back, but that was not what Ross was looking for. You see here, Brian goes ahead and swords away the Deathrite Shaman. We go over to Ross. He does not flip Death, Death Delver. He had not set it up. So it's still a 1-1. One, one. He attacks and may now be nearly out of resources. He just passes, but so a respite here, Brian also with no play. He also does not have a third land. No play and no land drop, most importantly. Here's a swing for us to, from Delver of Secrets. Brian almost had that Snapcaster into Swords to Plowshare start you're talking about. Instead, he'll just put Snapcaster Mage into play, trade it with the Delver. And that's not a good sign if you're Ross, because Brian's saying, my hand's so good that I can afford to just trade my Snapcaster with Swords of Plowshares in my graveyard. <laughs> just to keep my life total high and clear off the board. Ross plays Sylvan Library in Sesco. No plays from Brian. What I believe Brian is setting up for, as you see, that's a fifth card in his graveyard. He does have a copy of Dig Through Time in his hand. Yep. So there is actually some advantage to just trading away the Snapcaster Mage. And Ross is going to lend him a hand here. I mean, the Wasteland is uh, not what I, I think Brian wanted to have happen, but it is card number six in the graveyard. So, Yeah, so a float of mana and then delve six cards and he'll cast Dig Through Time. And that's going to work. So Brian, looking at seven seas, a whole slew of ponders. I don't know if any. I don't even know if there's a land in that top seven. Well, if there is one, he certainly is going to take it. Force yeah. of yeah, force of will entreat three ponders. He's got a volcanic, so he can take a second land here. But this is not one of those dig through times that pushes you ahead. If you're taking land number two in a hand trip, I mean it's good. It's better than nothing, but. Yeah, Brian, if he can make it to three mana, has a council's judgment in play. He can take care of that Sylvan library. Though he may not at this point. I mean, once it's in play, once Ross has drawn extra cards off, it's kind of the damage done. Exactly. Maybe he does want to remove it, but at that point, he's probably better served for moving Ross's creatures and trying to overpower him. And now that Ross has played the Wasteland, now he'll make a copy of Liliana and plus it up to four. No cards in the hand for Ross. This is why he did not take any extra cards off his Sylvan Library just yet. This is such a good setup, too. With, with Brian only with one land in play, it's going to take him a long time to get the spells out of his hand. So Ross is going to be hitting spells for a really long time here. Brian has no Divining Top in play, and so it's going to be hard for him to, to weather the Storm of Liliana. Now Sylvan Library on Ross's side.
And here you see him pay life to keep cards. He'll keep all three of them. Liliana pluses to five. He's going to discard one of the extra cards he kept. That's going to be a Misty Reinforce and just passes the turn. Not a good sign if you are Brian. That is a, that's such an aggressive play from us. Yeah, I'll take, uh, I'll pay four life just to keep an extra card to discard to my Liliana because these other ones are so good that I don't want to pitch any of them. Yep. And not even make a play. Just it's back on you. Well, well, the scary part is, is that Ross could have paid four, taken the Misty, and then to plus the Liliana. But no, he took eight. Yep. Because whatever that second card he kept was, it was just that good that he wanted it. He paid four life for the ability to have that card in his hand now as opposed to next turn. And so that's it. It could be force of will and a blue card. That's, right. a, that's a pretty easy justification for Ross's line of play here. Fetch from Brian. I think Brian might be taking a stab here with the Council's Judgment, just trying to get Liliana off the table. He's got Divine Top in hand, so if he gets Liliana off the table, next time he plays a Divine Top, and assuming Ross doesn't put it under much pressure, Brian might have an opportunity to undo all the damage that's been done thus far. Yeah, Ross doesn't actually have a threat, so if Brian can just trade with some of the stuff on the board, he can bring this game back to a spot where it's, which is okay for him. Yeah. And that's the power of Divine Top. You can fight through these attrition elements that the Soul Tide deck brings to the table post board. Yeah, and actually, it's not Liliana's not actually card advantage. And this is a gross play here that the Council Judgment has played, but Ross hard casting a daze to counter it. Yeah, that's bad news. I thought it might be Force of Will blue card. And getting, <laughs> getting hit by daze there is just brutal. And here's Sylvan Library again. We'll see if Ross, how many more life points he wants to pay. He can keep one, maybe two extra cards for the rest of the game. I don't think Ross wants to go down to two because Snapcaster Mage and Vendillion Collect then become things you have to start playing around. Can go to six, though, and believe he will. Plus the Liliana. And once again, look at these discards. Ross pitches Brainstorm to his own Liliana. And Brian's going to try for another dig through time. And this is the test spell. This allows him to maybe get Divine Top into play. And Ross, look at the setup. Spell pierces the dig through time. Brian now plays top, and Ross spell pierces it again. That, I mean, that was great sequencing from Brian there. He led with the dig through time, which is the splashier card. But if he's able to get Divine Top into play, all of a sudden, he can start pushing past the discard, all the discard effects and manipulating his draw. Well, the thing you have to remember is while Liliana's a threat, she's not actually card advantage. In fact, she's, she's kind of been card disadvantage here. They both have discarded cards to her every time. Right, but uh, Ross has generated enough card advantage in other ways that him trading that way is very good for him. Right, and now you have a situation where both players have no hand. Ross is using Sylvan Library to find a threat and then just plussing Liliana to keep both hands clean. And it's a really hard spot for Brian to get out of. And setting aside the card advantage argument, Ross's deck just plays so much better from this spot. If both yeah, players, three lands, sure. If both players mulligan down to three, let's say, Ross probably has a huge edge. So the more that he can make the game look like both players have mulliganed to three, the better off he is. And what I, I just like what Ross was doing here with this Liliana. He was discarding cards. He'd had a hand of, of, of Daze, Spell Pierce, Brainstorm. He's, he's plusing Liliana to discard Brainstorm out of his hand, which is, is really bold, but paying off for him. Well, he knows that if Brian's going to play catch up, it's going to be with spells. So he doesn't need the Brainstorm because the Spell Pierces are more important at that point. Keeping Brian off of things like, you know, miracling and something big yeah. or resolving a planeswalker that's what ross has got to stop well there's this temptation right for ross to keep a card like brainstorm to try to find another a creature threat say because he didn't have the tarmogoyf yet but just a lot of discipline on his side to just take those dazes yep and tarmogoyf continues to swing in for five now both players at six brian plays a fourth land and it just it's hard to see a way out of this for brian And Ross shows a Ponder, and that will be good enough. Ponder was the sorcery, I believe, that they needed to make the Tarmogoyf lethal. So very impressive game two there from Ross, and you can see that's sort of his recipe, is make the game about as resource light as possible, strip down both players' cards, and Brian's deck needs a lot of setup, a lot of engineering, a lot of land drops. Ross can play a very competitive game of Magic off of one or two lands. So the more that Ross can make the game about that sort of thing, the better serve he's going to be. Yeah, that soft permission that he's playing so good out of this Delver deck in, this, in the matchup. Well, he gets to be much better at fending off Brian's openings of Sensei's Divine Top or a turn to Counterbalance. Not that he particularly cares about Counterbalance, but 
uh, he is just able to punish Brian much more in the early game. Even things like Swords of Plowshares, Brainstorm, Snapcaster Mage, they get a lot worse with Ross's setup in the post-board games. And those are Brian's really critical cards in terms of getting from, let's say, turn one to turn four. That's the kind yeah. of thing he needs to do to be able to get to entreat Chase the Mind Sculptor in his more powerful late game action. It feels like between Day's Spell Pierce, Thought Seize, and Abrupt Decay, that Ross is ready to counter whatever opening Brian keeps. Exactly. Uh, the question isn't, isn't can Brian execute his own opening, because he won't be able to. It's, it's can Brian keep Ross off his opening. Now, with Ross going into Disruption Overload, that makes a Resolve Divine Top even more powerful, Brian, post-board. Yeah. And Ross doesn't have a lot of ways to stop it on the draw. He's basically looking at Force of Will. So, uh, in game one, you know, Ross gets Thoughtseize. He gets Spell Pierce. He, he has Days. He's got a lot of answers to a turn one Divine Top from Brian. In game three, if Brian just has a land and a Divine Top in his opening hand, he, it probably sticks. And that's a very big shift in the matchup when Ross is trying to control him with a bunch of discard effects. Now, do you think that's one of the reasons why we've seen in game two Ross still having Force of Wills in his deck? Sometimes in these attrition-based matchups, you see players board them out or cut down on the numbers, but not the case. You see Ross cast one Force of Will on that last Sylvan Library, saw two more. I mean, there's at least three still in the deck. It's not just an issue of divining top, although that's a big factor. It's also just Brian's got Jace the Mind Sculptor and Treat the Angels. He's just got powerful cards that are worth two spells out of Ross's hand. Yeah, I mean, certainly that Terminus, Ross didn't have the, the Force of Will for it and could have been backbreaking for him. Now, has Ross gone down to three Force of Wills? Maybe, can definitely see that. Same way I could see him going down to three copies of Abrupt Decay, but I'd be shocked if he cut those cards entirely out of his deck. And with that, we're gonna go to game three. Brian is back on the play. He's keeping on Ross's side. Him too, so we'll get a seven on seven this time as we are underway. Brian, this is the scary start. It's a turn one sensei dividing top and no force will from Ross. It's gonna stick. And, and this this dictates the way the game's gonna play. Now the pressure is on Ross to be aggressive and maybe erring on the side of a little bit of recklessness because the long game with his discard spells, he cannot play that as effectively as he could when Brian does not have a divine top in play. Yeah, if you kept a grip a handful of thought seizes, that's not gonna be good against a divining top. Right. So Ross has got to be as aggressive as he possibly can be. Well, here's one thought, Seize. You can see on Ross's hand, you know, his look there, he wasn't, wasn't thrilled about this. And actually looking at Brian's hand, Brian puts a lot of investment in Divining Top in this matchup. Yep. I mean, it, it, Force of Will plus Blue Card, uh, Divining Top, and some lands, one of which that shuffles, that's a no-brainer keep in this matchup. And Ross will take the Force of Will, leaving Brian with three lands and Snapcaster Mage. So, so really not much. Enough that Brian will just go ahead and spin his top in the upkeep. You see copy of Pyroblast here. Well, Ross does have his sideboarded Pithy Needle in hand. So that's the reason you see all the Force of Will get taken there. There's no spell right now for Brian to pair with the Snapcaster Mage, and this Needle has to resolve. And Brian plays Volcanic Island so he can Pyroblast, but now here's Pithy Needle. And this is, this is trouble for Brian. It takes away... His game plan, in a lot of ways, this hand is sculpted around the Divining Top. This is the whole thing. I mean, he, he's now down to a hand with Snapcaster Mage and some lands. Yeah, Pyro, Power Blast, Snapcaster Mage, and lands. And because he played Volcanic Island and not one of his fetch lands, he, he's going to kind of be locked for this. You know, he, can't, he can draw a card with the Divining Top, but it's not going to be a good card. Well, he can, he can basically do what he's doing right now, which is... Uh, draw and in response shuffle, so he can put the top on top of his deck. And, and then spin it. And, and then spin it, three. so he can spin it down below his next draw step, use the Aaron Mesa to sack it and not have to draw it down the line. Top card, land, terminus, and that divining top. None this of is which still he's really interested the, in. The damage is still done here. Brian is, it's gonna be way harder to play this game without the access to Divine Top. And it amplifies, again, the quality of Ross's discard and cards like Liliana the Veil. Yeah, I mean, Brian's hand is still just, you see, if he draws Terminus, you see it's it's Terminus, Pyroblast, and Snapcaster Mage. It's, it's kind of clunky. Yep, definitely. And he doesn't have a lot of ways to get the needle off the table. He's got his Council's Judgment. I'd be shocked if he brought in Wear Tear in this matchup. So uh, it, it's unlikely that this needle is going to get removed. Brian will go ahead and crack Aired Mesa to find another Tundra, shuffle away 
the Zensei's Divining Tap one turn before he would have drawn it. And now he'll ponder. Some lands and entreat the angels. I mean, kind of an awkward one because if he wants the entreat, he kind of just has to push it down to the bottom and keep the lands, and the lands run great here. It seems early for entreat. Maybe, maybe, maybe he still wants it. I don't know. I, I think if he thinks like Ross is just going to screw around a bunch and attack my hand, he might just try to punk him out with entreat. Let's see if Brian keeps them. He'll go ahead and shuffle. I think this line of play is fine too, but I think that in this spot with Brian not having access to his divine top and given the way that Ross is sideboarded, I think there's an argument for saying, whatever, I'm just going to go for Entreat on five. Uh, Ross has also shown enough soft permission that that's uh, some long odds. But Right, I mean, you're running into the possibility of Spell Pierce or Days, but... It's at least worth the pause there. I think it's a little bit more attractive to take the Entreat and the two lands than it looks in most spots. Yeah. You see on Brian's side, he drew his draw off the Ponder was a copy of Terminus. So right now Brian's sitting on two Terminus, a Pyroblast and a Snapcaster Mage and lands. It's a hand that's going to... It has the... Depending on what Ross's cards are, it could trade with everything Ross does. But if Ross has something like Liliana of the Veil, that's... That's not very easily answered by well, Ross, Brian's hand. Fortunately, Brian's got a, a ton of cushion and horrible cards to discard <laughs> for a little while at least. But. Yeah, I'll discard this uh, second Terminus. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I suppose Brian then can just start playing games like Snapcaster, Flashback, Ponder. Yeah. Sure. I mean, it's still probably positive for Ross to get Liliana in the play, but Brian's hand's set up in a way to, to fight through this because his hand just stinks right now. And it's going to be Liliana. Ross discards from land number four and four. Yeah, Brian, second Terminus is a pretty easy discard. I He's picked up a Divine <laughs> Top this turn that's locked out of the game. Another, Another easy discard. great card to get rid of. Here's Snapcaster Mage on Bonder. So I suppose that is one of the fair things. Your hand, Liliana doesn't care if your hand is good or bad. All those hands play the same against, against her. It's one of the most effective ways to play around discard is just have uncastable spells in your hand. <laughs> that you don't it even doesn't care. feel bad. Yeah. yeah. Whatever Ross is discarding has got to be better. It's a land or a spell. <laughs> it's better than whatever Brian's discarding. The Liliana is still bad news for Brian because it prevents him from being able to set up a good hand without access to Divining Top, but he doesn't have to care that much in the immediate sense about the discard clause because, well, he's got, he's got some stuff to discard. Go back over to Ross. So the Snapcaster isn't played. Actually, it will be a card that Ross will have to deal with. At some point, though, Brian will have to get rid of the Liliana. Yeah, it's true. But there's no immediate rush. Yeah, Ross will actually just put Liliana down to two to get rid of Snapcaster Mage. And he'll make Tarmogoyf go have on his own side just past the turn. And there's so much... Ross' deck is so lean here in that he only needs three lands in play, so he, he can discard so much more easily to things like Liliana. Yeah. That's why, you know, uh, Liliana is symmetrical and Ross has to invest the one card in Liliana to begin with. But because his deck plays a much better game when both players online are resources, it's not as simple to say, oh, well, it's even. They're both discarding the same number of cards. This is way more prohibitive for Brian than it is for Ross. Brian drew Jace the Mind Sculptor that turn. Thought if he could maybe play on a counter spell, but decided not to. He could have waited to five mana and try for Jace plus Red Bla the Pyroblast, but he didn't have the fifth mana. So he went for Jace, and it did meet a Force of Will on Ross's side. And Ross might be able to empty out here. I think Tassiker is the last card in his hand. If he finds something else cheap, he can just drop his hand on the table plus Liliana and put Brian to the test to find his copy of Terminus very quickly. And that's going to be Thought Seas from Ross. He'll see Terminus, Divining Ugh. Top, Divining Top, Oof, Pyroblast uh. with... Well... I mean, I guess you take the Terminus because Brian could draw a Brainstorm or something. Yeah, and that's going to be the play. Takes that leaves Brian with a really uncastable hand. And yet the last card on Ross's side is going to be Tassiger. He's going to make that delve away a bunch of cards, try to get the redundant one so he doesn't shrink his own Tarmogoyf. 
At this point, even when he pluses the Liliana, those Divining Tops, not only are they bad in Brian's hand, they're also going to pump the Tarmogoyf. Yeah, this is, this is an ugly, ugly turn for Brian. Yeah, Tarmogoyf up to 6-7, both Planeswalker and Artifact in the graveyard. Brian down to 13. And what a, what a night and day between the game one and then the post-board games in this matchup. It really feels like Ross is just advantaged. Discard spells and the ability to answer Divining Top is a very potent combination in this matchup. Ross will cast Brainstorm here. Give Brian opportunity to Red Blast something. Sure, that'll be a Red Blast. Liana will get another card. That's another Divining Top for, from Brian. Here's a swing for 10. Swords to Plowshares hits Tarmogoyf. That'll gain, prevent six of that damage. So Brian will take four, go to nine. But with one more mana, Tassiger starts, starts being online too. Yeah, I mean, Brian, it's not completely game over for Brian right now, but uh, obviously he's in a bad way right now. Yeah, Tassiger and a top deck Swords to Plowshares for Brian may be just enough. We'll see here. I mean, Ross's deck has a lot of reactive cards, so if he draws them, he can't plus the Liana that easily. So he needs to find a threat card, and th this is not the end of the world. Brian couldn't find Liliana up to five, then up and to treat six. the Angels and be right back in this game. Or, just, or Jace, yeah, or land for Ross. He's so, he's just plusing the Liliana. They're they're taking turns drawing cards here. See very fast. It's now Ross first one with a threat. That's going to be Deathrite Shaman. And now that he has a threat in play, he's going to go ahead and ultimate the Liliana. He's going to get to take care of three of Brian's lands, maybe four, depending on how he splits them. And this is in part to cut off and treat, make Jace, Jace a little bit less impactful. So Brian will keep his four lands. He gets to keep two planes and two tundras, so no more red mana for him. But it's going to be a ponder. You see now Jace dig through time sword and force of will. This is a great set of cards for Brian. Yeah, it's a little awkward in the face of the Liliana, but this is still... Uh, you know, Brian's still kicking. Yeah, I mean, he's maybe he draws the Force of Will, actually, which is the, the interesting part, because that's the one that he'll want to discard to Liliana. Yeah, he may want to try to go for something like discard this Force of Will, untap, dig, and try to play something in the same turn. Yeah, dig or he could jace. And this top-decked oh. Wasteland from Ross is such a beating. Because Brian kept all three of these cards on top of his deck, it means his next two draws are double blue spells. Oh, Deathrite may just kill goodness. him before that happens. And these are going to be some ugly discards here for Brian off of this Liliana. I mean, that Wasteland was the perfect, perfect card in that situation. Ponder from Ross, absolutely. And Ross is going to get to see Brian discard them one at a time, too, to that Liliana. And here's another Deathrite, and that, I think that should be lethal. Yeah, I mean, Br Brian had set up a reasonable spot. Uh, I, he was on the verge of getting back into it, I think, but that Wasteland with, with Brian keeping the cards the way that he did. And you actually have to give credit to Ross going all the way back to how he split those seven lands off the Liliana that allowed that Wasteland to actually get Brian down to single blue. Yeah, he said if you're, the three land pile is going to involve both of your volcanic islands, so I'll cut you off for red for the rest of the game and left him in a spot where if he drew Wasteland, he cuts off Brian's double blue for the rest of the game. You're right, that, that's Liliana's split. Looked innocuous, looked like it didn't really matter very much, but Ross set himself up for Wasteland being a huge draw there. And with that said, he puts Brian down to five with that Deathrite Shaman. And I, these end step Shaman activations should be enough. He can just pass, end step, deal four, untap, deal two more. Brian's draw here. He'll say go. That should be good enough. Ross is going to use one Deathrite. Use another death right, and that should be it. And Brian, he'll stop it there. So there we go. Ross Miriam at 8 0. He is your undefeated player here on day one of the Richmond Invitational. Congratulations, and Brian brought to win another great day one here. The Invitational fell a little bit short of having another unblemished day. Still 7 and 1, and a great opportunity to top it tomorrow. But for Ross, a perfect day one and playing a lazy deck that we've never seen him play before in Sultai Delver. Well,